All right. Uh, hello and welcome to this particular web design class. So um, I hope you can hear me and at the same time you can be able to see the slide. Someone to confirm? Anyone to confirm whether you can hear me and at the same time see the presentation? Yes, you can. All right, so uh, let's proceed. Thanks for that. Now, <clears throat> this uh, particular course is actually very, very practical, yeah. I think this is only, the introduction part is the only theory part, but beginning next week, you'll start uh, having some practical exercises. So we have designed or rather structure this particular uh, unit so that it doesn't really uh, force the student to do a lot of things because you see web design and development is very, very wide. That's why you have <clears throat> web design and also the advanced course part of it. So we'll try as much as possible to look at the fundamentals and ideally have some skills of how you can create your own website and an organizational website. I've been up and about, the system has not been that effective, so I've not really populated anything within the uh, module. Uh, but be rest assured that uh, by the time we meet next week, we shall have some notes and have the structure of what you need to learn. Of course, I'll also share the course outline. But briefly, across this introduction, I'll also just go through the course outline and understand what we need to, uh, to have covered during this particular semester. So I think more is going to be mentioned as we as we proceed. <clears throat> I'm also made to understand that you're going to be having both the DL and the PT. So if you're a, a DL student, let me know kindly. I think we only have one DL student. Are you there? Maybe the, he hasn't joined. Anyway, so I know most of us, uh, maybe you have already understood how to develop a website. This being an IT course, maybe you have started some hands-on uh, exercises on your own, or you have developed some <laughs> some website. I can't rule out that. But since this is a course, we're just going to confine and restrict ourselves uh, to the course outline. So we're going to introduce web design basics. More so, we are going to look at the XHTML and how to use the CSS. I normally say if time allows, we can always go ahead and look at other stuff. But for the, based on the past courses that we have handled, because uh, of the practicals, people could have, uh, the time frame has not been enough. So it depends. If we are able to handle a lot of content, you can always go ahead and do other stuff. All right, so how does the website or web design uh, methods, what are they, what is HTML and so on? So you're going to look at holistically, uh, how do we start developing a website? What is What must we have, for instance, uh, before we start, creating a website. Because you see, a good IT student should be able to know that any application that you're developing must pass through different stages. That's what we refer to as software development uh, phases, right? So this is just an example of a software that you need to develop. So what must you do before you really start designing and developing a website. So a good student should be able to know that you have some information. 
like gather the necessary information what the info, what you need this particular uh, website to do whether it is your personal whether it should convey this kind of information and then you need to go to maybe to some stage yeah design is when you develop is when you can be able to test then you can be able to implement then you review then ultimately you can now push this particular website to the production live server for other people to be able to use that particular website. So it's not just like uh, a clear road that you need to do on that. That's a good road, good road. So I'll really ask you to read more of how the various stages of website development or software development has gone. So that if someone asks you maybe to explain the various stages that you might need to develop a website, you should be in a position. But I, I'll briefly mention that. So I there's a website that I normally use to post relevant materials. Uh, it's learnerscoach.co.k. Actually, it is one of the uh, websites that normally come together as lecturers and update the content. So I'll always post some information from there, but ideally I'll share the link from the module. So any relevant material that I want to post is derived from the module. And of course, uh, since some of the courses or some of the classes that you've done, have been recorded. So I also have some YouTube plays that I can I always share those kind of materials. So if need be, I'll share the relevant uh, YouTube links so that at least you can be able to follow what you missed. Because I know some of you are engaged, some cannot be able to attend these classes. Or we can have some internet connection issues. So I could not be uh, audible enough. So those are things that pre-recorded videos help us to achieve. So in your own time, you can always go to what was discussed. So I don't really share all the recorded uh, videos. Asante. I don't always uh, Kindly just mute uh, so that we proceed. So ensure that you check your model regularly so that you don't miss any kind of information. Now, this is a part-time class, so you are not going to have the access to the lab. So I'm assuming you have some kind of uh, a good computer or <laughs> laptop that will enable you to do this kind of uh, practicals. Of course, you'll engage via Zoom, and the classes are supposed to start from 11. In case there's some kind of changes, I always communicate before time. So if I've not communicated, don't be in a, don't panic. Don't start saying X and Y. I'll always communicate. If there's no class, I'll always say. If there's class, you'll always see the link as I've done today. That is me, I don't really. So in case we don't have a class, I'll always communicate even two days or one day before so that you prepare in advance. But I doubt whether we are going to have or miss any class. We hope for the best. Same to you, ensure that you <clears throat> at least attend classes. See this, uh, these things are being recorded uh, within uh, Zoom. It captures the attendance automatically. So if I check on the attendance and I realize that you didn't attend, I think even if I give you the marks, I'll have to deduct just to penalize the attendance. So let's try it as much. If you can't make it, let me know. So what is expected of us? What are we going to do? You need to come up with a, a particular website at the end of this particular course. So I'll advise you just to start early, start planning early, the kind of website that you need to create. We are going to start from scratch. So the, in the previous classes, the people have told me that I already, I already have a website. No, 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 we are going to use this methodology. So even if you have a website, that is yours. 
we need the one that we're going to uh, based on this undertake. So we are going to look at two main websites, either a company based. I'm assuming that maybe you're working for a company or you have your own business, or you can have your personal a website, yeah, or a resume website, or one showing your portfolio. All those are uh, accepted, but you don't really need to have some <clears throat> very complicated website that surpass the requirements of this particular um, course or the a website that doesn't meet the requirements. So we are still going to do some balancing uh, on that. So ideally, as we proceed, you're going to see what is expected and you will make some informed uh, decision. So what you're not going to cover as a matter of fact, is to have some kind of complicated websites, like e-commerce websites or sites that perform some kind of payment. Yeah. We're going to just have a simple, and ideally you're going to have a simple website that 100% rely on extensible markup languages and CSS. If time allows, you're going to look at some a scripting uh, language or how to automate some kind of uh, services within the website itself. So we're not going to do Tara web, uh, graphic design. Uh, we're not going to use Photoshop, for instance, to design. So that's why I'm saying that there are things that you can be doing on your own at the back, like designing images. Mine is just to see how you present those images within our website. Just simple. So we're not really going to crack our heads. Uh, you know, I think this is first or second year as well. So maybe advanced web design, you can do it at some advanced uh, stage. So we are going to use Notepad or any other uh, editor that is available. Uh, any other editor that's available. I personally prefer Not, uh, Notepad because it's available. It is easy to use. Dreamweaver, yes, also it's easy to use, but again, uh, if you are a starter, it will really confuse you. Yeah. So for those who have some experience, you can always use Dreamweaver. Right? You're not going to use WordPress or any other CMS, kindly. So don't submit some work with these options. We are not really going to, uh, I'm not really going to award you marks. I, I need something that has been created from scratch, right? You see, even this, the, this content management system, you can't manage them if you don't understand the building blocks, yeah? the codes, the HTML tags, in case a, a site crashes, are you able to identify it? What is the problem with that? That is exactly what you want to understand, not the flashy aspect of the CMS, but can you be able to maybe create your own uh, template using the hands-on approach of HTML and CSS, and maybe some uh, scripting uh, languages. So as I mentioned, we'll have a number of assignments. That one be guaranteed for next week. We'll start looking at this, because these are practical class. So we mention something, and you'll be expected to do it uh, practically and submit that particular uh, work on time so that we move uh, very, very fast. Don't wait until the last time is when you, you send your work. As a matter of policy, you need to do two cuts, right? Uh, for this particular unit, what I normally do is that <clears throat> you only do one cut, and the second cut, I normally use your project. Yeah. So you do just one theory cut, and the second cut will be your project. So the website project that you're going to do will count for your cut two. Your cut one plus the assignments actually will add up to the final grade. I think you are now well conversant with uh, this. So when you're going to have a cut, I'll always uh, tell you well in advance so that you prepare. So attendance, I think that is well covered. We don't need really to talk more about. It. So you are 
I think you are responsible enough to know uh, what you need to do. There's a reason as to why you decided to attend this particular uh, course. So plan well. Matters academic integrity. There's this, uh, there's this tendency of students copy pasting or using other projects that have already been submitted before. Yeah. And then you send them as your final project. That is academic malpractice. You see, I always prefer you do something even if it's not perfect, but at least you can earn valid marks. If you are presenting your work, because at the end of the day, before you send your project, I'll take you through some presentation. So if I ask you a question on how you came up with that and you can't explain, then that will be a problem. So just ensure that every code, every HTML, every CSS that you're going to use within your project, you can explain exactly what it does. And of course, we also have the guidelines of what things you need to do within that particular project. So any added thing is not going to be uh, counted. So I think that is academic integrity that is. Otherwise, if it's not what you expect, I'll just give you a zero score. So any questions so far before we proceed? Anything clear or not clear? All right, so let's proceed and introduce this particular uh, topic. So, as a matter of fact, any development process starts from somewhere, or any kind of process starts from somewhere, then it ends somewhere. So, we are just in a process of understanding how web design and development is being carried out. So, we are not the first, neither are we going to be the last. So it started from something, right? So here, nowadays, people use uh, very many uh, or sophisticated applications to develop uh, their website. But what matters most is that each and every website has some element of HTML, has some elements of the core things that you're going to learn in this particular unit. Yeah, like the CSAs, how you can come up with the templates and so on. So in the beginning, we had, of course, the World Wide Web. This is the engine that ensures that you can have our websites published within the internet. And also we have the common language that every website understands or uses. So we have the HTML. Now we also have different versions of HTML, which I'm really not going to invest a lot of time. Yeah. But the current one is actually, I believe, HTML5. We had the extensible, which is almost similar to HTML5, but that's what you're going to use. Now, the coding structure is a little bit different. But the good thing is that if you have understood one HTML version, you can always handle any HTML version. I think it's just a matter of structuring the tags and so on. So at that time, we had a plane and really just simple uh, website structure developed by HTML. So we had simple tags, as you can see, and that is it, right? So we're still going to use this particular methodology just to understand what these HTML tags do. If you, someone opens a particular uh, source code of a website, are you able to tell that person what those codes mean? That is essential uh, thing. So we went ahead and added more features. So websites could actually be integrated with this kind of protocols, such as file transfer protocols. We could also up upload, download uh, files. Again, the client uh, software, that is the browsers, also were, uh, were actually advanced in terms of how they processed this particular HTML are files. So a lot of images or what we refer to as multimedia were incorporated and the website started taking shape. 
But again, also we realize that we could add more features to a website that organize the information in a presentable manner. And that's where we started creating tables, adding tables, frames, image maps, even forms, so that people could enter uh, the information within a website and something happens behind the scene. So this is just some history that I've uh, summarized. Then where we are and in future, we now have what you see is what you get or what you see is what you want kind of interfaces, very nicely presented interfaces, some kind of automated features. Yeah, you can play some video within your website. So we had this particular interactive components, uh, courtesy of these scripting languages like PHP, JavaScript, yeah. So we expect even more, much better version of our websites going forward. So we are going to look at uh, some extensible markup languages or, and the cascading style. Yeah. On your own, maybe later on when you're interested, you can learn these other add-ons, yeah? like animations, how to animate them, uh, various uh, content of your website, and so on. So that's just a brief understanding of how at the website journey has been. So we are in a in an age where we have some kind of interactive websites, uh, courtesy of the content management systems that we have. Talk about WordPress. We have, I think, the likes of Joomla. I, I mean, Joomla. I don't know whether it's there. Joomla I used to use it, and any other you, that you can think of, right? So what's the difference between a page and a website? So these are just some kind of things that you need to know, right? So if you talk about a website, uh, these are actually some kind of related pages that are put together, yeah? So a page is actually a stream, uh, sorry, a page is just a single HTML kind of code, yeah? They consist of related information. Like you can have a page about your website, about us page, mm -hmm. contact us page. You can also have other additional pages. But assume you have like 10 pages, now we can talk about a website. Right? So you can always say that a particular page within this particular website is not functioning properly. So you, can, you should be able to identify the page and actually the website. So in each and every website, there are different pages, and of course, other applications that run within those particular pages. But in our case, we need to understand how do we navigate from one page of a website to the other. So we're going to see how to create links. We have the CSS, how we can create external CSS, internal CSS, so that you can move from one page to the other, and from one part of the page to a different location within that particular uh, page. Should you have a link outside the website? Can you do that? Should you have a link to other pages? Can you do that? So that's what we're going to uh, maybe look at as we proceed. Now, in each and every website, you will require to have some web address. Yeah? How are we going to find where your, your website is? So we kind of have, we kind of have what we refer to as the URLs, commonly referred to as the URIs, yeah. uniform resource identifiers or uniform resource locators. Some will refer to it as web address. Yeah. So these are just unique names that we give to our website, but they have some structure that you need to understand as a web design and development. Yeah. So they mainly consist of three parts. They consist of the protocol. A protocol is actually a common language that helps or guides communication within the internet or website. Like for example, you can't have a website without the protocol hypertext transfer protocol. It can't. It can't be processed 
And so it needs, we need to have that. We have the secure version of these protocols, like HTTPS, yeah, hypertext secure. So the, those particular advanced uh, URLs that require some kind of security aspect. For instance, if you want to have an online store or e-commerce website, you need to have a secure protocol that runs on a, a socket layer. We also need to have some server name. We also need to have the likes of domain, a file, and so on. So this is just an uh, illustration of uh, some parts of our website. So take note of the server name. Of course, you can divide that into domain name, right? Like we have the learner's coach. Yeah. We, we have the learner's coach, and of course, we have the .co.k. Now, .co.k, that refers to the top level domain. Now, we have different flavors of these top level domains. You can have .com, you can have .co.k, you can have .org. So this just informs uh, the kind of website, maybe the location of your website. Like, for example, is it... Uh, a website that is from Kenya or is within Kenya, is it a government website? So these top level domains are a guide of what this particular website is all about. Yeah, like is it an NGO website, .org? So in your website also, you represent the file, the file name and the path, so that if you have the URL, you can always navigate the correct a file name or rather a website. Now, a website page. Now, if we resolve this particular URL, at the back, we are going to have an IP address. So each and every website URL actually is a representation of, our, of an IP address. So if we resolve this particular long name, we'll always have some IP address. And that's why it is always a unique. So every time, as you're going to see, every time when you want to maybe host your website, you'll always be exposed to parts of all search for the domain, whether it's available or not. That means if it's not, if it's not, if it's not available, that means someone has already used that particular IP address or name. Good. Uh, let's take a look at the web components. What are the various essential uh, web components? Uh, that we need to understand. We need to understand the concepts of clans and server. Now, this clans and server is like a mother of all technology that we have in the IT environment. Talk about the database, we have clans server. Talk about network, we have clans server. Any other API that you're developing, there must be a client side, there must be a server side. So I think it's a very common word that applies or cuts across the major technologies that we talk about. So clients are actually, it could be a computer, it could be an application or any software that sends or requests some kind of resource. Then the server will always be there to respond those particular requests by giving the correct resource or other services. So here, clients and servers are inseparable. Where we have servers, we must have clients because we can't have servers if you don't have clients. Yeah. Of course, we have an area where you can ha only have clients where, where we talk about peer-to-peer. -peer. So all clients are same. They can be servers and clients at the same time. So when we talk about web development, the class could be looked at in terms of the browsers, for instance, right? That are used to fetch pages from the server. Like if you have google.com, yeah, the browsers can enable us to fetch or retrieve google.com. So the server, the Google server is going to be done that. So the, the different browsers, I think I've listed even the ones that we used to use uh, days before, but I think you're familiar with um, 
Microsoft Edge, we have Opera Mini, we have Mozilla. Oh, Chrome is missing. Okay. Yes, Chrome is one of the widely used. I don't know what, why I've left out. But yes, we have a variety of browsers. And again, at the server end, we have the, the application or rather software that responds to the request from the client. Like you can have a server running on Apache, one with uh, Microsoft Internet Services, yeah, and so on. Yeah, all kind of um, uh, hosting companies, they have some kind of servers that they use. So I think it will be more important for us to understand the servers and the browsers. Now, the other component is the internet service provider. I mean, it's common sense that without these ISPs, we can't really share our websites. So it's a very crucial component that we need to understand. We have a number of ISPs in Kenya and maybe outside Kenya, which provides these internet services. Yeah. So for us to connect or actually uh, publish our websites, remember I can do local publishing, but that one will just be within our computer or rather the internet, where a majority of people cannot be able to see. But if we want our websites to be accessed, uh, through the internet, then we need to uh, host this particular uh, websites. So ideally we have this, uh, we also have the way the, the subscriptions, yeah, we have dial up, we have the list line options, yeah, basic connections and so on, just for you to have some access to the internet. Another component which is very crucial we have mentioned it, hosting services. You can have internet, but if you don't have a hosting company that's going to host for you your website, then it doesn't make sense. So hosting services also is very, very important. Now, I'll request you to look at a particular hosting service. We have a variety of hosting companies. We have Safaricom, we have Kenya, Web experts, host pinnacle, true host. I mean, there are a number of them. So just go to the websites and try to look at the services that they offer and compare them and make some informed decision after this particular discussion and see maybe what are the most important features that a hosting company should provide. Because yes, we have a number of them, but do they provide the required features. A good hosting company, for instance, might need to provide adequate disk space. Yeah, it needs to provide some email configurations. It needs to provide some secure socket layer. Yeah, it needs to provide some bandwidth. I mean, there are a lot of features that it needs to provide so that once we publish or host our website to them, we should not have issues accessing or clients accessing the website, right? So it's very, very important because your other role after this course is to guide people, yeah? Or tell them why they should host with this particular company and not this one because of the features that they, they have. That's why I say that it's not about web design and development. There's a whole lot of things that you need to understand throughout the way. Because you can have a very nice website, but it doesn't, it's of no use if people cannot be able to access it. Today it's up, tomorrow it's not there. Some files are being loaded, some files are not loaded. Someone has hacked the file. Even the security component aspect is very, very crucial. Uh, crucial. We also have the backup. So a good web hosting company should have a good backup system. So that if some there's some failures real, realized, we can always be up and running. 
uh, within a minute. And we can go on and on about hosting services. So kindly take a look at their websites, look at their hosting packages, look at their services, and make some informed decisions. We have already talked about these domains, URLs, and I think we all know this. So every time you want to create your website, you must have some URL, very unique. Yeah. So it comp comprises of the file name, the top level domain, the main domain, and the protocol, as you've already seen. Now, the other component is are the registrars. Now, registrars, most web hosting companies provide these, all these components, like the registrars. So you can go when you are looking for a particular domain name, there's only some registrars that are available that are going to register your domain so that at least they are, uh, they are unique. That's why once you look at their database, they always tell you that this is available, this is not available. They have some kind of uh, subscription and I think you can always pay for the, there's one off registration, I think there's yearly registration, I, I don't know. For your website URL to be always live, I think there are hosting. There's a hosting charges, I believe, and also there's a registration for the domain. But those are two different things that we need to factor in. But what I know is that most hosting companies offer also this added a support of domain registration, so that you just pay a whole package once. So they always combine a hosting fee together with a domain registration fee, right? So take note of that. So we have domain registrars who actually maintain some kind of databases of domains all over uh, the world, right? They all they are the ones who gives the unique IP address uh, for your website. All right, so those are fundamentals about web components and you can go on and on. Remember, I'm really doing some high level summary. I think if you look at all these, you can realize that there are other sub components that I've not talked about. Like I've just mentioned class and server, but I've not really gone into details about the Apache, Apache. I've not gone into details about the Microsoft WIS storm, right? Because of the nature of this particular course. If we decide to go deep, then we might not realize <coughs> the expectations. Now, what do we need to understand when you're creating a website? You've already seen whatever is necessary. So number one is to choose a domain name, register it with that registrar, choose a hosting, ensure that you have that unique IP address, then you start creating your web content. So ideal is not a must that you start, you, you first of all pay posting is when you start creating your web content. You should be different. You can always create your website locally from your computer. Then once you are done, you can now upload it. Yeah, you can always upload your files to your what? Uh, to your um, server or web, web hosting company server. Now, the good thing with this kind of understanding is that it gives you time to finish or polish your website before you upload it. Yeah, because once you subscribe to that hosting package, it'll always start deducting the number of days. So why should you have a website that is not fully functional? Yeah, it's better you finish developing it locally and then you push it using the file transfer protocols. So you have very free uh, tools or actually applications that can allow you to transfer your files to the uh, servers. And of course, the last part is to publish that particular website. And that's what I was, I was referring to. I use the correct 
uh, file transfer protocol application. Now, these are whole topic altogether because uh, we also need to ensure that our website is um, search engine friendly. What do you mean by search engine friendly? It starts with how we organize our content, the kind of uh, how we present our content, for instance. Like, do we have broken links? That is not a good thing for search engines. Uh, content that doesn't maybe have some right keywords. Uh, a page or a website that doesn't have well linked pages or organized content, my friend is not going to be searchable. Even if you give me your URL, yeah, Google doesn't like website that doesn't have well organized a content or has issues with the content arrangement. So that's a factor that maybe we need to understand that it's not only about creating the website, but we need to take note of even the grammar of that particular, the information that you present in that particular content. Image, you're going to look at some essential things that you need to consider when you're using or other people's work. Yeah. You need to acknowledge. So should you use someone's image without telling a Google where you got it? Or if Google look as, looks at your website and find that this information you are, that you're using is already available in someone's, um, is in someone's website. Of course, they can't tell you, but what Google does or any search engine will do is just to profile you. It will profile your website, yeah? It will just like try to kill it so that it's not searchable. And if you understand how Google alg algorithm works, then you'll uh, actually acknowledge and don't use other people's content. And that's why we always talk about originality or website content rather than just copy pasting other people's work. Principles of a good web design. What are some of the things that you need to factor in uh, for your website to actually stand out? Because you have a lot of websites. Really. If you have a website selling some products or showcasing some services, similar to another person. What makes someone to come to a website and not the other person's website? You need to consider these factors. It should be visitor centric. You see, this is a problem that most of us developers um, have, especially even myself. Yeah? We normally create this particular software, really not factoring in the person who is going to use it. But we tend to create it to fulfill our inner feeling, yeah? That this website, you see, it is good. It's good for you, but is it good for the person who is going to be looking or searching for information from it? That's why we really require some easy to navigate websites. Don't complicate it from your end for getting about uh, the other person who is going to be looking for this particular information. So the visitor here is very, very crucial. The audience, yeah? Let's this particular web design or the website be visitor centric. It should communicate a clear purpose, whether it's education-based content, it's a service-based website, yeah? If I'm looking for some courses online from a private university, I expect the first search result to display KCA University, for instance, right? Communicating clear purpose that this university is a, is a private university and it offers courses. So there's a clear purpose of your web. Uh, you should have a clear purpose of what your website is all about. Don't mix content. It will confuse your visitors. Now, uh, also be very, very open. If that's why I say that if you're using other people's content, just try to be open and say that this image 
we found it from this website, acknowledged. Also, if, for example, the website that perform some kind of um, backdoor businesses, yeah, where you, you're selling some products indirectly on your website. You don't know get these things such as maybe doing some digital marketing, then you're paid some commission, affiliate marketing, for instance. Let your visitors be aware, be very candid with them, open with them, let them be aware that if they click on this particular link, it will direct them to another link. And this is what is going to happen. Progressive disclosure. Or website, my website is going to capture your email address for the purpose of marketing. See, every website you go nowadays, you are told to enter your email address. So actually within that particular pop-up uh, banner, it's good to indicate why you are capturing an individual's email, for instance or when you have the contacts form, tell them why they need to fill that particular, uh, particular contacts form. It's for what purpose? Because you can't just end up capturing other people's information without them knowing the reason behind that. So progressive disclosure is very, very important. Now, also a good web design should be able to load content very, very fast. Personally, I'm allergic to websites that I keep on waiting for them to load. So you need to factor in, in, and we are also going to look at this. Like for example, if you need to use images, my friend, take note of the size of that particular image and the type of image. Is it a JPEG, is it a PNG? I mean, these are some of the small factors that makes people maybe either come to your website or leave that particular website. Yeah, like you have bulky content, things that really take time to load. You have some scripts. Java scripts by the same. I mean, those are things that you can try to eliminate so that when someone is uh, looking at the information from your site, they should do that easily. And the content should load very, very fast. Now, our browser compatibility is another principle that we need to factor in. And this one brings the idea of testing your website across multiple browsers before you launch it. When you're developing a website, try to open it in, for example, Microsoft Edge and see how the content displays. Do the same on the browser such as Chrome. Try it with maybe Mozilla and see whether they are common, they, the appearance is common in all these particular browsers. Because there are some elements that you're going to use that within your website that's going to show in the Chrome browser, but they can't show within Microsoft Edge. So you can try now to see how to balance that. So browser compatibility is something that you need to factor in. I mean, it goes without saying that navigation is very, very key. I don't want to get lost on your website. I need to have a clear structure. We're going to look at this thing before the end of this. We need to have a clear structure of how to navigate. We have basic uh, browsers, people who actually look for information. <laughs> yeah, people are trying to get to understand how to use a website for the very first time. We have experts such as you. Yeah. So we need to factor in, especially those who look for information. Normally there are these uh, novice people, they're trying to understand or look for information. So you need to have some intuitive navigation that is not that, that is going to allow them to move from one part of your website to the other and trace back their way to the homepage and so on without maybe getting lost. I think I've also mentioned this, Errors, grammar, errors, spelling mistakes. Try to use these available tools. I think there's a grammarly check that allows you to run your code and remove those particular grammar errors, spelling mistakes. Do some proofreading anyway at the end. 
we are going to look at that so that at least your content stands out. So security of your website also is very, very important. I think we talk about security when you're looking at the e-commerce website, but I think it's something that you need to start understanding right now. Even your website, if it's not for e-commerce, most people are nowadays educated. Once they look at your website and they see the protocol is not secure, then they'll walk away, run away from that website very, very fast. So you should compel the, the hosting company to provide the secure socket layer protocol so that the websites are secure. You should also aim to have attractive design and easy to read. Don't have a very complicated yeah, let it just be simple. If you look at some of these uh, websites uh, for organizations, maybe such as Kenya Airways, Safaricom, you can see they are not really complicated. They're very simple. Yeah, You can easily read the content, move from one page to the other, yeah, and so on. Another thing to factor in is that your website cuts across the border. In as much as you're going to have a domain name or top level domain name, search engine doesn't understand that. If someone in India is trying to look for content that is in your website, and that website is in, it can be found from Kenya, then search engine is going to display that content for him or her. So avoid being biased. Yeah, know that the content that you display within your website will one day fall on someone or far away who is going to read your content. So what are these cultural bias? We know what is happening. Like you can't have some content that is really, again, uh, that is not augering well in some other people, uh, tradition, for example. Yeah, like we have Muslim, we have Christians. Yeah, avoid racism kind of content. I mean, so you need to factor in this because the people are going to, the visitors should, all visitors should come to your, your website. And we are talking about, uh, from the view that you're not the one who is going to use this. You'll be developing website for other people. Yeah. So you're the one who should, uh, give them the ultimate guide. I'll say that broken links are unacceptable. We have tools that can automatically, I'll share with you the freely available website that you can run your, your, your website so that it shows you where we have broken links. So it's going to be very, very bad. Once I click on your website link, I come to your website, and the first link I click on your website, no page found. Yeah, no page found. Anyway, you understand what I mean. So maintainer, uh, the website should be maintainable. Use codes. We have what we refer to as comments. If you're creating a website and you're using some scripts or tags, one thing, you need to do is to try to comment so that the other person who is going to maintain it to be able to understand the code that you have used. Apart from that, also try to separate uh, your content yeah, from the real code so that at least someone can easily go over it very, very fast. No need to repeat about that. I think it's more about what you have discussed. So the main purpose of a web or to design a web is to inform or educate information. Yeah. This is now when you tell students, hey, tell us the reason of why you need to use internet. Yeah. Yeah. Any features of internet, first it should allow, enable us to do some research. Yeah. So the interface that the, the user actually interacts with is uh, when maybe visiting the internet is <laughs> the browser. The browser only displays the web pages 
and the web pages are from your website. So what are the content uh, of your website? So it should be content that someone can always come back uh, to look at. So it should be able to inform, it should be able to persuade. Persuading meaning that it's a website meant for marketing purposes or trying to tell people the kind of products or services that you engage in. Now, as we explain this particular web design, the factors that can actually influence either positively or negatively the overall look of our website, like technology. Yeah, that's why we say that at least you need to try to test your web your website across multiple web browsers uh, before you release it. But you also have other technology. Like for example, you can have your content running on some kind of animation. But you realize that maybe from the client side or the user side, they don't have those particular application to be able to play animated video or those animations. So it could, in one way, positive or negative, yeah, the nature of content ideally also. Yeah. We normally talk about the desires of the audience or what the audience is looking for. Now, there are those particular people who might come to your website, yes, but they don't like the text. They might prefer graphics or infographics right? Or they might prefer videos. That's why we are going to look at how to update the website with a video, for instance, embed a video on a website. Yeah, so you can always have those options. So don't just have a website that's just full of text from page one to page X. Try to have some images, try to have some uh, videos. And of course, we might really love to have a very flashy, nice, website but there's limitation of the budget or time you're going to look at this very crucial yeah now most of you uh maybe if you have not be prepared if you start developing website for your class you'll only always run um into this economic issue uh, they'll tell you that hey we need this particular website by tomorrow mm -hmm. They'll tell you that we need this particular website to do this, to do that, to do that, to do this. But if you talk about the, the, what they need in monetary terms, they'll tell you, ah, that website is so expensive. Yeah. So these are some of the constraints that you're likely, that you're likely to influence how you design your website. So then you will compromise. You'll tell them that, okay, if you can't afford that, then let me remove this and this and this and this and this. And let me only provide these influences of web design. Again, we don't overdo uh, the visuals. Now that I've said you can you can have multimedia effects. Don't overdo a lot of uh, visuals. Like you I go to your page and the first page I can't even see something to read. Yeah. They are just images, images, images. Even I don't know that images is what. So, now, our websites should actually thrive to meet usability objectives. We have looked at navigation issues. Yeah. We are also going to look at the coloring. <laughs> background color, use of fonts. These are some of the things that you need to factor in. Otherwise, if you don't use the right font or if you don't use the right background color, uh, it might make people not like your content much. Other influences are mentioned. We've already mentioned the browsers. Uh, of course, when you look at the servers, there are those that operate Windows, operating system, there are those that operate Linux. So you, I don't know, most people say that uh, when you want to maybe have some faster web, website that can be accessed faster, can use a 
you can use the, um, the servers that run OS, Linux OS. I don't really, uh, but that is what people normally say. But the whole idea here is it also depends with the objective of your websites. Like what I know that is if you want to create some kind of um, nice forms, Windows provides, like if you use the .NET framework, Windows provides a very cool feature for that. So you can host your website within Windows. Anyway, these are just influences. I would go on to go into details. Another thing that influence is actually the connection speed. That's why I've told you, I've given you an assignment. Go to the respective websites for these particular hosting companies and look at what they offer. Because most people host their websites without really keenly looking at the packages or the specifications. Once you have hosted, is when you realize the downtime, right? The speed aspect. So these are some of the things that we need to uh, factor in because they can always influence the design of our, of our web page. Of course, the user speed. We, nowadays people are going, or people are using mobiles to browse a lot. So as we create our website, let's uh, understand that most of the visitors will not use the laptop to open our, our our websites. So we need to factor in the mobile screen yeah, and also these other computing devices. This is very, very crucial. Yeah, And apart from that, the resolution also matters as you adjust the, um, the size of your images, factor in the resolution of the screens that people are going to. So mostly people use the 1,000 by 700 pixels, because um, people want to view images and videos that have very nice colors. So the content drives how the website looks, very, very important. So like for example, sites designed for students look different from the ones designed for staff. Yeah. And of course, the ones that are designed for employees could be different from the ones designed for your clients. So we all agree that the common influencer of how we create our website is actually the user. Yeah, the end person, the end user who is going to look at our website is going is the actually number one thing that is going to inform us of the kind of content that you're going to push out there. there. Yeah. All right, the other influence is the quality of content, right? Also the content that you place there. If you're a tech, if it's a tech website, if it's an educational website, I try to improve the quality, for instance, of the subject. Yeah, you need to, if, if, I, if, you, if your website is about programming or teaching people programming, then we need to understand. If I come there, I need to get the quality. I need to have some command yeah, of the subject from your website. That is what we refer to that. So have site reviewed. Again, every time, if it's an organization website, you can involve other key stakeholders to frequently look at or periodically look at your content or website, they might add two or three ideas. Even if you are the web administrator, they might add two or three ideas about that particular website. So don't give the website to your friends or people who will not criticize it. No, also criticism is good. I like the person who tell you, my friend, that website is slow, <laughs> do something. That is good, yeah. Unlike someone who's just going to tell you, ah, you, that website is good, there's no problem, you know? So try to find people who will tell you. Others who are good in grammar can help you proofread your content, yeah. Because the first person who will visit will always have or see things differently. 
Now, economic consideration, as we design and develop our websites, this is a very crucial concern. Yeah, the budget aspect, right? So budget aspect is actually not <laughs> the money as per se, but you you understand maybe that the other factors, internal organization factors that can always contribute to the budget aspect. Like if, for example, you want to maintain your website and the users or the employees are using that particular website for some economic value, or rather communicating with their clients, right? Then we need to factor in that. So do we budget that time that that particular website is going to be you're maintaining? It? Yeah. And of course, also the time that maybe the staff will be waiting for you to create some modules or something. Yeah. So these are some of the concerns that we need to factor. Uh, we also need to look at the other option, whether the site is going to be developed in-house or it's going to be outsourced. Yeah. So we need to do some kind of um, uh, balancing or look at looking at uh, what we refer to as cost benefit analysis uh, by introducing new people to come and do it for us or just use the right uh, the available resource so there are some of the consideration that you as the web developer need to factor in we are looking at things here not that for now this is your perspective because we are also hoping that one day you are going to uh, ensure that you give the organization the right direction of how this particular development process works uh, so that they don't overspend on some stuff. So making of a good design content is important, but content alone will not make your site work. So the design aspect of your website is very, very crucial. So there's this website here, you can see how it, is, it has been designed. And I think this is something that maybe we might wish that our website have in future. So a good design, as you have mentioned, should be understandable. You don't have complicated design. I don't like the way most people overuse the plugins. <laughs> and the various themes that are available, especially those who are using the content management systems. Some even use the templates that they don't, themselves they don't understand how they work. Interesting, a good design should be interesting. It should be easy to use and also uniform in look and feel, right? We're going to see why this is very necessary. Yeah, you know, if your front page or home page is having some blue background, if I click on the next page, I get a red uh, background. Just a bit. Oh, hey, Martha, what's wrong? What's wrong? So we should be consistent in our content display so that the design actually uh, becomes seamless so that we don't have, uh, like we, someone is within our website that, but they feel that they are using like four different websites. Uh, so uniform in look and feel for your design is very, very important. As a matter of fact, it should be done from the visitor's point of view. I used to miss this point a lot, and that's why I always emphasize it. Because most of us just need to create something that makes us happy, but not considering the visitor. So even if someone calls you and tells you this, if you feel that 
So what you see is what you want or what you get is very, very fundamental. So we have to consider some maxims. So rules are only guidelines. No single one can fit everyone's choice or situation. So we should just endeavor in following the right principles. Because there are a lot of things that will inform why you need to use images, a lot of images, why you need to use videos. So we can't really say that uh, we can only use a single model. So we can always see what is right for our visitors and so on. So remember this, what you see is what you get. Visitors are centric. We should have our visitor centric option. Don't force visitors down to the path. You're going to look at uh, different navigation options that you need to have. No, no, we have the top, uh, we have a top down option, we have breadth option, we have deep. That there are those options that if a visitor is used, they can always feel that they have got getting the content very fast. Some people hide a lot of content far away, which is not uh, really uh, good. So in summary, I think we have already looked at this. We had four generations. So what we have right now is a content-based generation. Anyway, the two general ways of designing a web methods of designing a website, you can always use these two options. Either following a well thought step, yeah, methodological, or method, methodical step or step approach. That's what I was talking about, following a program development approach. Or you can use the ad hoc process. Now, most organizations, and that's why I pity, I pity web designers a lot. Most organizations will want just tell you, hey, we need a website to do this and that. Can we have it by today, even? Right? So that's an ad hoc. You have to follow some ad hoc. We call them the seat of the pants. You need to do things very, very fast. Create your website on the fly. Yeah? But we have a properly structured website that has step-by-step -step way of undertaking it. That also is under frequent quality assurance testing, great planning. They all come with their ups and downs. I hope process is not bad. I mean, in fact, most people use it, right? And especially when you have an already existing website, ad hoc process is a good one because you can always add some pages very, very fast. Now, the following one, the one that's pulling from method, methodological approach is the one that is a bit complicated. So pitfalls of ad hoc process, you might end up with many <laughs> under construction banners because it was done hastily. So you don't really care about how you linked your work. So many people not be accessing your website. It is also a, a process that might lead to old content, recycling old content, because you don't have time to have fresh idea and content. Using data designer techniques, errors, uh, confusing scripts, then you can also end up with spaghetti codes, uh, codes that really don't have a nicely, a well laid out structure. You can't even understand. There are no, there are no organization of your codes. Yeah. You don't have comments, don't, nothing. Just copy paste comment and things work. Difficult to update and maintain because there's no clear structure. You don't know even which HTML version you need. So things are just done half -hazard. Benefits, though, they have the benefits. They're good. Yeah, they're saying that it's quick and dirty, not only good enough, but it's the best way. It's used for sites that have a short span. Like maybe if you are having some kind of um, some kind of seminar within your organization and you want to maybe uh, create some websites, uh, pages to I talk about the theme of that particular seminar. 
uh, so that visitors can enter what the thoughts. So it's good for that. Anyway. Then after the end of the seminar, bring it down. It's also good for small websites. They also best for sites designed for specific purposes. As we have said, maybe for us, an event, for instance. Then once you're done, you can always uh, bring it down. So why take time to design and test before launching? Now, the reason I say I think I'm not going to discuss the, the, these other options is because we are already looking at it. Uh, a structured way of designing our that's what we're doing right now, understanding um, what to do at what time and how. So why take the time to design a test before launching? It's very, very important. I think we have already looked at this. Yeah? To minimize the problems that you might face, uh, like broken links, uh, I think it's more important to take a lot of time in testing your website before you actually uh, launch it. Yeah. So to avoid the issues that I've already looked at, like grammar and so on, navigation issues. Okay. So that's why I say that before you really start creating that website, consider your organization's mission and vision, the core values. Yeah? What is the, this organization vision? Is it relating with the website? That's why I would say that every time you look at an organization and you look at the website, what they do is very consistent with what the website actually, the content of the website. Yeah. So you need to factor in that. So if, if you are given the work of creating a website for an organization, you start with the first phase, understanding or gathering information and understanding that organization before you start piecing the website all together. Define the target audience. That one has already been discussed. And of course, set the goals of this particular website. You have looked at ad hoc options. Is it for short time or long term? Then ensure that you organize your content so that you have different pages when laid out. So you can have page one talking about who we are, the other page talking about what we do, and organize them in form of hierarchy. Create out some sitemap or outline for your content. Personally, I like using sketches or models before I start creating one. I, I like, I don't like, even you guys, you can always sketch have some roadmap or sitemap well laid out within your paper. And I think that's what I'll require you to give me before you start creating your project. So that as you start creating, you know how many pages you're going to have. This page is going to be linked to this one. This one is going to be linked to this one. Or you can use the available tools like the flowcharts and so on to draft your website. Right. This, when you have this free design work, it will give you a lot of time to develop your website rather than mark timing. See, if you don't have a roadmap of where you're going, you just be guessing. You go five steps forward, you make 10 steps backward. Of course, you need to organize your files logically. How? PDF files, have word files, have image files. So you can always have various folders. That is it, right? We don't want an, a place where you just have all the files in one folder. So that means if the folder has it with all your files, it will not be retrieved. But just take the files to better understand it. So as I mentioned, disability aspect is very, very important. We are creating these web design websites for people. So we need to factor in that. Like this visual item here, 
So we can say, this is the text we are comparing, and there's this one, this organization or organogram yeah, that has bottles. So which one will you prefer? Of course, you'll prefer those ones with nice visual. So you can try to use this option for usability aspect. Make it easy to read. Yeah. So factors that affect readability could be, of course, poor eyesight of users. You can factor in that. We're going to look at the color. Uh, the color, I can mix the color. Also factor in the smaller or older computers. Also color, I've said that. Yeah. And of course, the cocktail party effect. The cocktail party is where you have the spaghetti content. Yeah. Mix a lot of things. It might not be good. So how do this? Uh, how do we fix this? Try to use a lot of white spaces. White spaces are actually the areas that doesn't have either any content. Uh, so try to at least balance your white spaces. Use the large fonts or go for fonts that are readable. Yeah. Try to use contrast between text and background. Yeah. There are those people who tend to use analog as background and text colors. Yeah, Blue as your font, light blue as your background. Those are not good. So let's have white contrast. Uh, colors. I think you're going to look at that. So also don't just rely on a color alone. You can use other elements such as symbols yeah, to differentiate some things within your own. Let's see. Just give me one minute. I respond to some call here and then we proceed. All right, thanks for that. Uh, now, <clears throat> so that is it. We can use just basic uh, things to fix our usability issues. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you will not design and develop websites for your entire life. Yeah? You reach a level where you are going to be meeting stakeholders and giving them direction on how to develop websites. So these are some of the things that you, the information that you need to have so that if you are guiding people on how to create websites, you should have some right information. Anyway, uh, So when you talk about his ability, also users memory is a very great factor. People remember the good things, yeah. And of course, if I get strained in navigating within your website, then I get lost, then chances are it will not be a good thing, yeah. So try to use some kind of easy to navigate options. 
And also when you isolate or rather organize your content, try to use some things that, uh, or symbols for instance, that visitors can relate to. If you're giving services or if you're offering products, you can try to use the product images, for instance. You can organize your content by using, for example, templates. You can have some templates that users can know that this area is for. Maybe blog, this area is maybe for this. So right way of organizing your content actually is very, very and of course, separate away, have us a way to separate the visited links and unvisited links so that the visitor will know that ah, I've been here. I clicked on this particular link. That's why it has done this particular color so that they can remember that they have been here. Yeah. So also limit, let's not have a very long uh, navigation, like for example, top of uh, main, yeah. There are those particular websites. If you visit them, if you click on the drop down menu, it starts from the top to the bottom. Yeah, it doesn't. So let's limit the items. Yeah, we can have some branches, uh, the pop up menus, and so on. Response time is also important. We have looked at that. Personally, this one is one thing that I look. If one second, no major potential to interrupt, 10 seconds, you will become bored. More than 10 seconds, I'm gone, right? So we need to also factor in this, and this one relies on different things, as you've already seen. I think there's no need of repeating. We need to look at the features of our web hosting. We need to know how we are, uh, the kind of content that we have, and the the various apps that are running within our website. So to make our website accessible, factor in the design should be navigation should be very clear and simple. Use well understood visual layout. Have some descriptive uh, descriptive links. Yeah. I think we are. This is very common. Click here. Instead of just having click here, you can just write and have that information. Uh, visit our page, or visit our homepage. So homepage there, I can just be clickable. I provide text equivalent for non-text. In case there's some kind of loading issues or uh, your images are not appearing, we have alternative text uh, that will show what that image was all about. As I mentioned, don't only rely on color. You can always use uh, other options. I look at the screen resolution, your web, uh, the kind of pixels that you're using I should conform to the user's gadget. And of course, don't like complete on high tech solutions. Factor in all, that, all other these solutions that you have. I think these use markup, we're going to look at all of them. We're going to look at the extensible markup language that conforms to a particular uh, structure of tags. Yeah, so we could be using strong instead of big and, and so on. So there are a lot of factors that we need to put into consideration as far as accessibility is concerned. Good. Once your content is up, ensure that you can proofread that. You have already looked at this. Very, very important. Now, the last bullet there, I'm going also to show you some. You're going to use a particular a website just to ensure that you are you validate your um, the accessibility or rather your website so that it doesn't have a lot of broken links and so on. So we have this validator.w3.org. We cannot it down. It's the one that you're going to be using to 
uh, check or validate our website. So very free option. Of course, we need to maintain our website. Ask ourselves who is going to maintain that. Yeah. What will happen? Is there another option in case people cannot access our website? Like for example, if I don't get a page or the page is not available, can it direct me to somewhere? Yeah. How would we back up our sites? Most people just rely on the servers. Once you host your website, you are done. Yeah. I happen to have a contract with uh, one of the UN agencies, UNEP. I was tasked to develop a particular app for them. And I'll tell you for sure, don't rely to back up your copies of website or anything within that particular server that is hosting your website. You will see a long day. So I was really having issues. I had to trace because I think it was a it was a it was a kind of um, it was a malicious web uh, a web hosting company. So I had to trace the route up to the original a web hosting company. Yeah. So I think the original web hosting company was the Bluehost. I had to pay some amount so that they can will give me some backup copy of that particular data. So it is it's important that backup. You can have multiple backups, either the cloud, you can have some else so that if it's a crucial website, like mine was a very crucial app, so that you can always retrieve those copies. The so schedule as a quarterly review of your site. We need to have some well laid out plan of maintenance yeah, so that you don't just ambush our uh, users that today we are having some maintenance so let's just have a plan that people can uh, follow so we have looked at a number of things and more majorly as i mentioned they rotate around the basics of how we can have the right website so as i mentioned I'm, we're not going to look at how you can do the graphic design, but I'm just going to mention how you can identify this particular graphic design. So let's look at this, uh, seven options of web design. So factor in using simple pictures or small graphics, uh, use reduced file size. I think we have like, a normal computer should be having, I think, is it Microsoft something? There's some kind of image software that you can use to reduce the size of that image. Yeah. So keep backgrounds when you're using graphical images, uh, try to keep your background simple and not busy. Right? Let, don't overdo your images. Yeah. Yeah, as far as navigation is concerned, we have said make or use some simple consistent navigation. Consistency is that if you are trying, if you're using horizontal stuff, use it. If you want to maintain the vertical option, you know, we have those navigations. Let's, or you can't, if you want to employ both, let's just have some consistency. Organize your pages. Yeah, remember, it is the visitor who will look at this particular page. Don't confuse your visitors. Three clicks is just enough for me to find what I'm looking for. So if I have to click on this part, I'm still not getting what, go to the next page, not yet there. Yeah, so the sixth page that's not going to give me the, that's not good. For text, we are going to look at how to structure our text. It's good to use right spacing, have your content well spaced, yeah, ensure that people can be able to view that particular text. Headings, you can use heading one all the way to heading four. Now, these are practicals now. Yeah, this is just talking, but now we are going to practically see how to do this. So, have some kind of uh, 
horizontal lines with the correct font. Links, very, very important. I think they are the interface for us to move from one page to the other and from one object to the other. So ensure that we can always differentiate. Uh, I think you've already mentioned this. The colors are very important. Some, pro, some prefer kind of highlighting links so that someone can always see that there's a link there. Then after you've clicked on it, the color changes. Also have simple links. Focus on the content, consistency. Yeah. Your content should be very consistent. Don't, don't have italized content on one page, the other one is italized and talking about different things. Yeah. So be concise and factual. Content is the king. I mean, that's why we actually go to look for those information. So when talking about content, it revolves a lot of things. So just focus on the content. Maintenance, proofreading, everything. We already looked at that. So we'll try to look and find out if it is deadly. I've said that I'm going to show you some free websites that are available that can always use to validate your website just to ensure that they're free of broken links. Of course, for grammar, I've said we have, they are long, very free of, yeah. If you have to take this site temporarily, ensure that you have uh, some communication banner uh, telling your visitors that we are down for some few minutes and you'll be back uh, soon. Very good. So these are the design templates that I was talking about. There are those, I can say there are those uh, complicated ones. Yeah. We have the basic grid format that you click on A1, A2, A3, you're done. If you go to B1, B2, so this is very basic. Any visitor can use the basic grid format. But most pages or the right template, most templates actually use this hierarchical format where you have the home page, then the other sub pages follows. Uh, if I was uh, teaching definition of information architecture, I could have gone ahead and tell you which which these pages are, how do we how we call this structure in details. But this is what we refer to as hierarchical. We have other complicated options like this web layer. Now this is now how <laughs> the entire web looks like very confusing because we'll find out that at least one uh, one object could link maybe to three or four pages or one, uh, I mean, one menu could result to more than, and that's what is being uh, shown here. But you have this other option that is very straightforward. Um, now, in summary of these templates, you can see the complex is best for the educated audience, such as me and you, who understand exactly where to find this information. There are some sites actually, like for example, if you want, for instance, maybe to, re to register, yeah, you'll be taken through very many steps for you to have that registration link. So you can see the simple best option, linear narrative, right? And we also have the vertical structure. Then we have nonlinear. This one is very confusing. So again, who is your user? That is the question. Are there people who understand how to navigate? Are they students, for instance? Are they old people who are coming to look at maybe their pension information? Don't make such people to have a lot of, I mean, confusing links just be so you have to understand your users who they are and the kind of information that they be using so that is what is going to actually inform the kind of template that you can create for your website or use for your website now files on the web is very important i'll say that you can always create your files locally and then upload them yeah so we have different categories of files we have video files, we have word files, I mean, PDF files, image files, 
uh, audio files, I mean, all these categories of files, we can always ensure that we categorize them and place them in their own uh, folders. But apart from that, also what you need to understand are how to identify those particular files. Because if users complain that your video file is not available or actually there's some issues with your video file, if you go to the backend, you need to understand how those particular video files are represented, which file types or extension. That is the most important thing, yeah? So you need to know maybe it is the format of MP3 that is not good. Maybe you need to convert it to another. You need to know that that is a doc file that is missing. Yeah. So let's try to understand these file types based on the extension. Yeah. If it's the image files, if it's a .gif, what is that? .jpg, what is that? We are going to look at images later on. Yeah. So we, we need to structure our files in a good manner so that at least we can easily access them. Uh, remember that if these particular files are not well represented, or someone can hack and maybe can lose everything. So also we have some level of security that you need to append to how or who can be able to access the files. Like if it's a PDF and it should be accessed by the the admins alone, you can adjust that, but that is a subject to another day. All right, so in summary, I know we are about there, this being the first class, I mean, just, I've really combined a lot of things so that we also factor in the, I think we were to have the first class last week somehow. Now, so when setting out to design a new website, you have plenty of decisions to make. You have already looked at a number of them. These are just, uh, these are just, but what you have. But let's look at um, the choice of color, which is very, very important. Yeah. Personally, I'm not good with the colors, but you need to be guided if you want to be a good web designer. Yeah. So we should limit the number of main colors on our site. To four, uh, four meaning excluding white and black. <laughs> you know, some people, if you visit the website, I mean, you can think that it's a rainbow website, yeah, or a website talking about rainbow. Let's try to minimize these colors. How do we minimize them? So we can use a complementary scheme, yeah. You, you remember when I was talking about high contrast, yeah. Either you can decide your font to have line and your background to have this picture, or you can decide to have yellow and dark blue, red and lime, yeah. I think those ones, I prefer using that so that we have some complementary colors yeah, that are directly opposite. You can also decide to use triad scheme uh, when you need some wide color diversity. You can decide to use some lime, red, pink, which is also good. Yeah. And then you add white and black. As uh, you can use white as your space and black as your font or for the font color. We also have analogous. This is what I was saying that you can always avoid, especially where you have some background that not, doesn't ogre well. You, people might not see the font or the text, but they are cool because they, they are really not shouting. You can see. So it also depends on the content that you are displaying. So I think in the matter of choosing fonts and sizes, we say that there's no really a general model that you can really stick to. But let's just skip to these tips. Yeah. Someone can read for us these tips. At least I hear your voice here. Francis, you can read for us the tips for choosing fonts and sizes, or you have gone. 
we can be there. No, no, <laughs> no me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Read for us. Oh, okay. So the first tip is uh, many designers uh, use two different fonts of their sites, uh, one for headings and uh, one for regular body text. Yes, so the next one is a uh, font size must be large enough to uh, re read easily. Uh, consider 12px to be the minimum acceptable size. Then the third one is a uh, black text on a white background is the most common. However, any light color text with a dark background or dark color text with a light background can be acceptable, provided there is a uh, strong contrast. Then uh, the second last, avoid using bright colors for for text and uh, lastly avoid underlining text or making text blue for emphasis as uh, this can easily be mistaken for link text use bold or uh, italics for em emphasis instead yeah thanks now ideally those are some of the tips that you might need to use when using your fonts and sizes and using the sizes i'll take it back again is that we don't have one common option. It might also be based on the user preference. Maybe some users will tell you, ah, as we like this font. So who are you? Give them 14 then. Uh, 14 size font. So we have uh, a guiding uh, placeholder here that can always, I think most are people are familiar with it, lorem ipsum. Yeah. So it allows you to just have some dummy kind of text, mock-up text of how your content is going to look like. So before you consider having the real content, I try to use or capture the various content areas are using this uh, dummy uh, text so that at least you know how it's going to appear. Now I like for starters, I like this kind of arrangement. You can see there's a header. So when you're but you are work. This one is good. Yeah, so you have your sidebars, footer, header. Then, so this is just a, a good option. Anyway, text placeholders are very, very good to use, so that at least if you replace them with the actual content, you are familiar with how it's going to appear. White space is very, very essential. Don't have clouded. Yeah, don't have clouded content try to have some white color or white space, yeah? So that at least you, our content looks separated. So don't overdo it, yeah? Don't have a, then again, a lot of white space. Just try to be moderate so that at least they are well paced. Our navigation menus, there's a lot that we need to understand about navigations. Yeah? We have different categories of navigation. But uh, again, let's just stick to the one and such as this. Uh, I think this is a widely used, the horizontal. Then if you click, you can have some drop down options. Yeah. So if you decide to have like this, you can always, for instance, replicate this option. Because what the user expect is that if I, if I have this navigation on my uh, homepage, if I move to the next page, they expect to have a similar. That means for us to have a consistent navigation menu, you can always have it that, uh, place it within the header so that it just replicates within every page so that you avoid confusion. So planning for screen resol resolution, very, very important. As we are going to set up our, we are going to be setting up our images, and parts of our website, I think we're going to look at this in uh, details, the kind of pixels that is that can be used and so on. Of course, testing is very, very crucial. Any software development process or any simple app that you're developing is bound to have some form of uh, testing. So we need to ensure that every part of our website is working correctly, avoid broken links. Test your website using at least three or four browsers. 
before you actually allege it. Aim for consistency, as a matter of fact, ensure that you align your groups of content, especially the um, when you're trying to have navigations, yeah, so that people are not lost. Always proofread your site uh, content. So there are a lot of design tips that we can always uh, talk about. So in our next class, we are going to start off by looking at XHTML and see how we can create our website. Then we are going to look at cascading style sheets and look at the difference of why we need to use markup language and cascading. Why, what does cascading do? And I think the cascading style sheet is a game changer. Because yeah? if you have some thorough understanding of HTML, and the CSS, my friend, there's no website that can really give you issue. The others are just now to, you can use them to name your website, such as the JavaScript. You can use this one to uh, name your website. So if time allows, we are going to look at maybe one or two ways of uh, using these scripts. Of course, I've, I've mentioned that they are very freely available editors that you can use to create our website. I prefer Notepad. I don't know what you're using, but I need a standard editor. Yeah. So don't use an editor that you yourself <laughs> cannot be able to explain or does, doesn't understand how to save the web pages. It reminds me of the, of the database design and development class I had with my friends. Yeah. So I told them to use my SQL as they to carry out those particular SQL queries, but some decided to use other uh, platforms. I can remember there's one who used the MS uh, SQL, I think it was 2012 20, 20, version. Yeah, so they could not even tell me how the database was created and so let's use something that we are all familiar with that is what i'm trying to say to avoid you repeating a lot of things so ladies and gentlemen i think i am i might have gone through the content very fast but they are very basic all i need us to understand uh, the main concept the design issues posting yeah maybe you can go ahead and look at the different types of websites that can be created, like e-commerce sites, yeah, and so on. So next time we meet, we'll meet and start talking about XHML. I'll share the notes within the module. And of course, I'll also share the first assignment because after you've done, I normally do two hours and then the next, in fact, one and a half, two hours there about, and then the next couple of hours are for practicals. So that's how this course is structured. So let's ensure that after the class, the remaining time, because it's a four hour class, the remaining time, since you are part timers, you utilize it. Just dedicate yourself, tell yourself that this class is four hours. So even if this class is over, I have an assignment to do. So why don't I just be disciplined enough? I do it and then submit it before the four hours, the four hour classes. I had issues with the last semester's class. That's why I'm telling you. Some didn't even, well, didn't manage to submit all the assignments. I, I think even there's no one who has done even, I think except of two or three people because of the nature of their work. Some are calling me, you know, I, I'm at this place, I can't be able. So if you have opportunity, just utilize the time before something comes up, yeah? I think I did most of my, uh, most of my master's class with a lot of problems, yeah? So I understand when you're working and you're doing part timing and so on, there are a lot of issues that comes on board. So try to stick to that time. 
don't say that the lecture is over, I'll do the assignment at some point, you'll forget. And when the deadline has come, you'll start blaming. So I think, unless you have a question, I'll stop there. So it's, it's a minute, a minute to one. Any question? Now, I have shared the, the enrollment key to ensure that you are part and parcel of the, the virtual class or the virtual, I don't know it's a virtual what, that model platform so that you get to know what is happening inside that place. So I'll always just be updating the notes and the assignments. Yeah. They are there, it's only that we they migrated from the other platform. Otherwise, they could just be there, you access it. So I have to start all over again. So this this uh, before I I think before I create the um, before I populate the mo the model for you, I'll share a link so that you can get these particular notes. Otherwise. You have a nice weekend. Thanks. Okay, enjoy the rest of the day as well. Bye. You too, thank you.